Hey, how's it going guys? It's Nate here. And a horrifying universe like the one Fallout 4 thrusts us into is enough to turn anyone into a monster. If the constant fight for survival against, well, monsters and other humans doesn't eat away at your sense of sanity, the radiation certainly will. As a result, Fallout 4 is absolutely filled with all sorts of crazy or otherwise deranged characters. Indeed, it seems no matter the direction we look, there's some lunatic raider or mad gunner out to cause chaos. But some of the folks in this wild wasteland are especially bananas. So delusional or strange that they warrant their own special mentions in a video like this. So, you can probably figure where I'm going from here. Sit back and relax as we take a look at five of the most insane characters in Fallout 4. Starting off, we're heading on over to the East Boston Preparatory School to take a look at what may very well be the cruelest character in this game, which is absolutely saying something. Judge Zeller. He leads a large gang of raiders held up in the building, but his cabal of bandits is no ordinary one. You see, he has some unorthodox recruiting tactics. As various terminals reveal throughout the prep school, the way Zeller enlists people into his army is by kidnapping them and torturing them into signing a blood contract that swears their lives to him. Indeed, one terminal entry describes a raider known as Beggar, who allegedly was a traitor who got lured into going inside of the prep school thinking it was a settlement or something. Once caught, he was starved for days, until he finally signed the pact under threat of being fed to rats. And sure enough, on every single raider we kill here, a note titled Blood Contract can be found, written in red ink in their inventories. Reading, quote, With my blood I do swear my life to the judge and his jury until the end, upon pain of torture and death. End quote. So, yeah, this Zeller dude is basically leading a slave army. If you have a good relationship with Bunker Hill and have already aided the settlement a couple of times, Kessler, the settlement's de facto mayor, will request that you take out Judge Zeller once and for all, as his men have been attacking Bunker Hill's various allied merchants and traders. This in spite of the town paying him tribute and Judge having previously promised to stop. So, not only is he an evil warlord, the dude's a liar too! Interestingly, it's kind of hard for me to show Zeller to you, as despite having such a strong backstory attached to him, his appearance is totally randomized by the game. He happened to spawn in full cage armor in my playthrough. No matter, whenever you're given the chance, just make sure that this lunatic pays the price for his devious deeds. Next on our list, I don't think a video like this could ever come anything close to complete without giving a mention to Pikmin. He's a man who's married a passion for painting with an everlasting hatred of raiders in a very, uh, interesting way, if you will. He hunts down raiders, kills slash captures them, and then uses their remains to craft all sorts of paintings and sculptures. When we visit his home slash gallery in North Boston, Initially, we'll find it being stormed by a large gang of raiders, evidently all of whom are mad at the fact that Pikmin's been butchering their men. As we make our way through the various rooms and hallways, we can look upon a series of terrifying images and some other artistic displays that are probably a bit advertiser unfriendly. Anyway, eventually our little gallery walk will lead us into the sewers beneath the building, where more works in progress may be discovered. And soon enough, we'll encounter Pikmin himself, being held up by a group of three raiders who seem to have just captured him. At this point, we can either intervene and save Pikmin by confronting his attackers, or just wait and let them kill him. However, even if we let the bandits kill Pikmin, they'll still be hostile to you and you'll have to take them all out anyway. So there's not much sense in that. After saving his life, Pikmin will greet and thank the player in a surprisingly well-mannered and controlled way. He comes across as incredibly polite and carries himself well. Things you wouldn't expect for someone who, you know, kills people and turns them into ornaments. 
After expressing his gratitude, Pikmin will gift the Soul Survivor a key to a safe of his, with some loot inside. This, in his eyes, is your reward for all your help. And that essentially concludes our interactions with Pikmin. But it's worth pointing out that there's a little bit more to this character than just that. He seems to have been inspired by H.P. Lovecraft's Pikmin's Model, a short story that tells the tale of a disturbed painter named Richard U. Pikmin from Boston. In the story, Richard spent his days painting terrifying images of monsters, and the story eventually concludes with the revelation that the monsters he'd been painting all this time were actually real. So, not quite a serial killer like Bethesda made his namesake out to be, but still, Lovecraft's Pikmin was a very interesting character. Now let's just hope that the images Fallout's Pikmin is painting aren't quite as real, either. Coming in at number 3, we have a uniquely delusional character, who thinks they're saving the commonwealth, but are in fact doing anything but. The Mechanist. The primary antagonist of the Automaton DLC questline, the Mechanist has been deploying an entire army's worth of bloodthirsty robots across the wasteland, and these bots have been attacking everything with a pulse they come across. It will be up to us to track this sicko down to their factory, and once and for all, put an end to their automated evil. Though, there's a bit of a twist. We ultimately conclude this short quest line, realizing that the Mechanist isn't actually evil at all. Just a bit accident-prone. The character's real name is Isabel Cruz, a socially awkward young woman who grew up in a settlement that was constantly subject to super mutant raids. Being a pretty smart girl, when Isabel eventually found this factory, she went to work putting together a legion of automated allies that she hoped to one day use not to conquer the Commonwealth, but to save it. She wanted her bots to go around taking out mutants and raiders to protect the innocent. But, thanks to a bug in their code created by a particularly annoying robo-brain, all of her robots malfunctioned and started attacking all living creatures. Isabel herself, being too shy to ever leave her factory, simply never found out, and thus she never realizes the true harm she's been causing. Until you explain it all to her, that is. We'll get to choose between accepting the woman's poor apology and letting her go, or refuse and force Isabel to pay the ultimate price. Frankly, it's a rather sad set of circumstances. But it's also far from the first time a character named The Mechanist has appeared in the Fallout universe. Of course, back in Fallout 3, in the town of Canterbury, a man named Scott Bean Walensky took up the identity and fancied himself some kind of superhero, as he spent his days battling it out with another grown dude in a costume who called himself the Antagonizer. Much like Isabel, Scott, despite having somewhat pure intentions, really just made a mess of things and hurt a lot of people that didn't need hurting. Furthermore, the Mechanist is also the central antagonist of the Fallout 4 in-game radio show, The Silver Shroud, as the plot revolves around a robot gang terrorizing the city, led by said character, who's also secretly the mayor of Boston in disguise. I know, it's Scooby-Doo levels of hilarious hijinks. Regardless of the various other actors who have portrayed her character, Isabel Cruz as the Mechanist is certainly one of Fallout 4's most complicated personalities. For fourth spot, we're heading on over to Dunwich Boars, perhaps the creepiest location in Fallout 4. It's a pre-war, raider-occupied quarry that was created with a bit of a twist. You see, while on the surface it was constructed to simply gather stone, the company behind it was secretly trying to dig up something else. It's not exactly 100% clear what that something else was, but a simple dive down into this hole will quickly erase any doubt that something sinister was happening here. You'll occasionally hear giant footsteps, and the ground will shake every few seconds. You'll experience various flashbacks depicting strange scenes of sacrifice, and terminals even suggest this was a place of cult-like religious significance. Most people suspect that there's some sort of Cthulhu-like god that the Dunwich Company was trying to connect with, but no one totally knows for sure. Anyway, 
The raiders inside of Dunwich Boars originally came down here just to mine some stone and steel for themselves. However, seemingly due to the dark forces at play, something's gone awry for them. And now, let's just say they're no longer themselves. No better is this fact made apparent than by looking into the leader of this game. Meet Bedlam. She's a raider who can be found near her terminal towards the bottom of the quarry. And it's this terminal and the various diary entries Bedlam wrote in it that give us some very creepy insight. Apparently Bedlam herself only relatively recently transferred to the quarry, having spent most of her time working for an allied raider group nearby. She came here to lead the forces after reports of them slacking off and misbehaving. In her earliest entries, Bedlam comes across as no-nonsense and ambitious to quickly whip these raiders into shape. She notes that some of the men are lazy or whispering to themselves, but largely just writes it off. Long story short, after just a couple more entries reporting difficulties with the mine, it seems the woman just completely snaps. The last document on her computer simply reads the following phrase, quote, I am safe in the light, repeated 32 times. Yeah, something's got to this individual. Sadly, we don't get too much time to chat and ask her what's going on, as just like the entire force of raiders here, Bedlam is permanently set as a very hostile. A bit of a fun fact regarding her name, Bedlam seems to be a nod by Bethesda to the Bethlehem Royal Hospital in London, a famous psychiatric hospital in London, nicknamed Bedlam. I should also mention that Bethlehem's actually still open, and it's not nearly as spooky as it used to be. But that's neither here nor there. Whatever the case, it seems Bethesda at least named this raider rather appropriately. And finally, last on our list, we have one of my personal favorites, Brother Simon. Or Thomas, or Brother Andrew, or Brother Matthew, it's weird, his name changes depending on where you're at in the game, but it's the same character. Anyway, Brother Simon, which is the name he spawned under in my game, isn't crazy in the same way Bedlam is. Not in the sense that he's literally lost his mind and is going mad, but he's crazy in the sense that, how can you be doing this to people, sort of way. Held up at the Charlesview Amphitheater on the banks of the Boston River, he leads a small group, or cult, of people known as the Pillars of the Community. When you first come across these folks, weird is probably the best way you can describe the feeling. They're all dressed totally inappropriately, and they speak oddly optimistically. It doesn't make a lot of sense with the wasteland. Apparently, these followers of Brother Simon have been encouraged to give up their worldly possessions, and instead trade them for the sense of community that he's offering here at the amphitheater. He claims to send missionaries far and wide across the Commonwealth and beyond, trying to recruit more devotees. As you speak to him, it should quickly become clear that this man is full of nonsense. He's clearly lying and a con artist. He doesn't believe what he's saying. He's just trying to get a bunch of people to follow him around. But rather than call him out, which might provoke him and the followers to turn hostile, if you instead pretend to be interested in this little organization of his, he'll invite you to follow him back into his office where he'll formally offer you the chance to join the pillars of the community. All you need to do is give him literally everything you own. That's right, he demands you give him every single item in your inventory. And even better yet, you can actually agree. You can indeed press the agree button and give him everything. Your clothes will immediately be stripped from your character and you'll walk away with nothing. What's the advantage to doing this, you may ask? Well, there isn't one. You do get some slightly unique dialogue from other members of the Pillars of the Community who welcome you into their new family, but that's not worth a whole lot. And if you try to talk to Brother Simon about progressing further within the family, he'll just kind of get confused and stumble as he talks to you. He doesn't know what he's doing either. Now, if you refuse to give Brother Simon everything you own while you're in his office and say, no, I don't want to join, then he'll take the mask off and threaten to kill you if you don't. And if you proceed to refuse, then he'll turn hostile. 
If you do, for whatever reason, decide to give Brother Simon everything you own, fear not, because you can still get it back. You'll just either need to immediately pickpocket it from him, or break into the back room behind his office, where after a couple of days, all of your items will be spawned in, inside of a chest. During the Cabot House questline, Emma Jean Takes a Lover, we'll have to come over to the Charles View Amphitheater and rescue a girl named Emma Jean, who has fallen in love with Brother Simon, and convince her to leave. We'll also need to convince Brother Simon to let her leave, either with our silver tongue or with our ammunition. All things considered, though, you gotta give props to Brother Simon. He was able to build a small army of followers and become very wealthy for himself, all without ever needing to even pick up a weapon. And in a universe like Fallout's, that is absolutely an achievement. And with that, we are going to wrap up five of the craziest characters in Fallout 4. Thanks for stopping by, everybody. Which of these interesting NPCs did you find to be the most fun to study? And which folks would you like to see if we tackle this topic yet again? Leave a comment down below. As always, like ratings are very much appreciated. Again, thanks for watching, and I hope to catch you all in my next video. Peace out, everyone.